really be an open discussion. Uh, Tim Page is going to lead uh, the conversation from the critics as they speak about their view on their role as critics and their role, role of music criticism within the context of the modern world. Uh, there will be a question and answer session that follows that. In the subsequent days, what will happen is the students will have the great fortune of having their work presented in the public uh, for uh, obviously uh, their names will at least be changed. <laughs> not fully deleted. And this will be a chance where the critics are actually working with them right into the open session. So as the first review has not occurred yet, because tonight is our first concert with the Service uh, we're going to use this opportunity to really discuss uh, the art and practice of criticism itself. So without further ado, we're going to have to turn it over to the Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, we're going to be talking uh, a bit about the profession that most of us have followed. We've all worked as music critics at one point or another. Um, Steve Rubin has generously underwritten this institute uh, where we are in the very fortunate position of being able to work with some very fine young musicians who are also thinkers about music. Uh, and we, we get to work with them, and they learn some from us, and we learn a great deal from them, too. We had a terrific session this morning, and I'm looking forward to these public events and also to actually reading the critiques uh, tomorrow uh, when, when we have them and actually going over them uh, and discussing, you know, the, the how, how they did, what they thought, and... Um, I hope you'll all be able to join us then, too. Um, I thought I would start by just, um, I mean, you, you, you certainly have access to our biographies, but uh, biographies don't really tell everything, and they certainly don't explain how it is that we all became classical music critics. It's not one of those things that a lot of kids want to be. Um, and uh, I, I must confess, I would have been very surprised when I started off uh, at 24 to find myself having been a music critic for as many years as I was. On the other hand, I don't think I would have regretted it at all. But I thought I would just throw out that question to my, um, to my, my colleagues on the panel here. Just a little bit about what drew you into uh, this particular discipline, um, and uh, you know any abiding philosophies that come to mind right now. And anyone who wants to start this is welcome to, or we can just go right down the, the line. Go down the line. All right, <laughs> Alex, would you mind starting? All right, well, uh, I'm Alex Ross, the music critic of The New Yorker, and of course it's a great pleasure to be here uh, at another edition of the uh, Institute. Uh, I more or less blundered into music criticism, as I think uh, many of my, my colleagues did. I, uh, I would have been surprised uh, if someone had told me uh, when I was young that this was to be my career. In fact, I think I remember a high school teacher predicting uh, that, that I might become a music critic, and, and I think I was a little dismayed <laughs> um, that that was uh, all I was going to uh, amount to. Uh, but uh, it was just, it was more just something that had never occurred to me even as a, as a, as a possibility, uh, as a realistic uh, opportunity. I was very immersed in music as a kid. I, I played the oboe and piano and made various attempts to compose, and when all that inevitably petered out by the time I was 17 or 18, I assumed I would go off in some other direction, uh, involving writing, uh, which was really a primary love of mine. Uh, but during college, I found myself at the college radio station uh, talking about music on my show excessively <laughs> and uh, writing some, some reviews for a little program guide we, we put out. Uh, and that was, well, that was really the, the beginning. I, I sort of found that I enjoyed that. Still didn't conceive of a career uh, doing it, uh, but after college, uh, I did a few freelance assignments here and there uh, and found that I had a, a knack for it and one thing led to another and I moved to New York in, in 1992 uh, to be their lowliest uh, freelance uh, critic uh, and I did that for four years uh, and then the New Yorker came calling and, and I've been at the New Yorker since 1996. Uh, so it, it really was a, a gradual immersion. Uh, I really found myself doing the job before I even thought of the, uh, the, the, the reality of it. Um, and 
have, I'm still learning. I think it's, it's, a, it's a job that you're, you're forced to learn in public. You make mistakes early on. You continue to make mistakes all the way through. Uh, but you grow wiser and, and more experienced. Uh, and I think uh, the, the, the energy of young critics is something we very much need, but we also need the, uh, you know, now older and wiser <laughs> voice. So I find myself somewhat to my surprise at, uh, filling that role. And, and uh, hopefully we'll keep on going for, for a while longer. But uh, I very much appreciate my role at The New Yorker, which is more as a sort of a second or, or a third voice uh, after the, the New York Times. Of course, uh, I, I weigh in a bit later. Uh, I have a bit more time to uh, digest uh, performances, and uh, I think this is you know, very much we, we, we need more of these auxiliary voices in, in the music uh, critic uh, world, uh, as well as the, the, the primary voices of the you know, leading newspapers in, in each city. So uh, I think that's a particularly useful role for me to fill. Heidi. <coughs> well, I'd say I also, um, I'm Heidi Wilson, I'm the critic for the Wall Street Journal. I primarily write about opera, though I do occasionally write about other things, but that's, that's my principal interest. And uh, like Alex, I would say that I pretty much blundered into the field as well. Um, my plan as a child was that I was going to be a surgeon. Um, that, was <laughs> that didn't work out. I was an English major in college and sort of blundered through my um, pre-med, not very successfully. But um, ended up, my first job in New York was at the Metropolitan Opera guild as a writer of educational materials. Um, and so I moved on from that to become a freelance writer of educational materials and a freelance writer of all kinds of things. And I started writing for the arts and leisure section of the New York Times um, and discovered that uh, reporting and feature writing was something that I really tremendously enjoyed. I loved interviewing people. I loved finding out the story behind the music. I really liked um, finding out what people thought, but, but musicians, composers, conductors, singers, um, what they thought about what it was that they were doing. And um, I started writing for different magazines doing these kinds of things, and um, started writing also for the Wall Street Journal, mostly doing features, and uh, moved into the opera side of it because um, the lead opera critic was really only interested covering the big houses, and I discovered that there was a lot of really great stuff happening in the smaller companies, in the festivals, um, in places that she didn't necessarily like to go. So I moved into that, and um, that became my beat, and when she left, um, the whole opera world became my beat. And uh, one of the things that I enjoy most about the Wall Street Journal is that because we are a national paper, I have a lot of leeway to travel around the country and see what's happening in a lot of different cities and see how um, opera companies and other kinds of organizations and these cultural organizations in these cities go up and down and the relationship that they have with their community and how when different artistic directors and different managers come in, how things change. Um, and how um, how different institutions rise in the you know in the field and fall, and I really love having that global perspective. John, I uh, grew up in San Francisco, <coughs> and uh, my father and mother were amateur amateur violinists and pianists, respectively, and would play the odd sonata in the living room. And they had a kind of small but diverse record collection. Burl Ives, Mahalia Jackson, South Pacific, Brahms and Beethoven's violin concertos, etc. Um, and I used to listen to the hit parade a lot before rock and roll came along. Uh, and then I loved, I have the first pressing of the 45 Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel. But then my tastes gravitated towards classical music. and. Uh, from an early age, I figured that I'd gotten going a little late on, uh, I mean, I'd taken piano lessons as a boy, but I wasn't very good. And uh, I once took it upon myself to read Hermann Scherchen's book about conducting, and I found that a little daunting. <laughs> so at, early on, I figured maybe I should write about it rather than try to do it. And so at the age of 15, I went and saw Alfred Frankenstein at the San Francisco Chronicle, who was extremely gracious and uh, told me that many are called and few are chosen. Very uh, more 
tr more true today than then, but he told me about his 20s in Chicago after he graduated from the University of Chicago, where he kicked around Chicago doing freelance and trying to get a job as a music critic, but not only, only got one when he was about 30. Well, that's exactly what happened to me. I went on to college. I thought I'd major in music, and I did. For, I mean, I took all the basic harmony courses and so forth, but, uh, and I did a lot of uh, programs on WHRB at Harvard, like Alex, and, um, but rather earlier. And um, they just invented radio at the time. And, um, <laughs> in any case, um, and then I went out, wound up in Berkeley uh, to get a PhD in German cultural history, but I, I wasn't, I was still trying to be a music critic. I did a lot of radio out here, did some television criticism for KQED, wrote program notes for the San Francisco Opera, but just like Frankenstein, I didn't really get a job until the very end of my 20s where I got six months of interim work as classical music and dance critic for the Oakland Tribune, and then Martin Bernheimer hired me to go down and be his assistant in classical music and dance at the LA Times, which I did for nearly three years, and I was also the West Coast correspondent for Opera News at this point. But I was restless like a moth to the flame to get to New York, and so Errol Schoenberg finally said, uh, you can quit your staff job at the LA Times and come be a freelancer at the New York Times. And arrogantly, I figured, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> and, uh, and so I did. And uh, anyway, I continued doing classical music, not dance because they had a dance department, but they didn't have a rock department. And so I became the chief rock critic all during the 70s, as well as doing classical music. And then they wanted me to do that full time. And so I wound up being classical music editor and uh, sort of the number two classical critic all during the 80s. But then in the 90s, I went off to Paris to be the first European cultural correspondent of the New York Times, bringing wife and daughter along. And, uh, and then I came back, I got homesick, and I came back, on, and then Beverly Sills and Nat Leventhal hired me to start the Lincoln Center Festival, the summer festival. So I did that for four years, and then I got nostalgic for journalism, so I came back and was the editor of the Sunday Arts and Leisure section at the Times. Then I was an arts columnist, then I was the chief dance critic, and then I retired at the, age, at the end of 2006. Since then, I've done a variety of freelance things, sort of as they come along. I'm not really questing after stuff to do. I edited a coffee table book about the 60s for the Times, my decade. Um, you know, I, I just I do a lot of different talks and panels and boards and stuff like that, and uh, that's where I am now. Ann. I'm Ann Majette, and I'm in a freakishly tall chair. I am not actually taller than John Rockwell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm the chief classical music critic of the Washington Post, a mantle I inherited from Tim Page in 2008. Um, I grew up in a family of artists and performers, and so critics were horrible, awful people, and I never wanted to be one. And um, in fact, to her dying day, my grandmother would look at me and shake her head and say, this is not what we expected from you. <laughs> um, I wanted to be a writer, a, a real writer, not a journalist. And um, I majored in classical civilization at Yale, thinking that speaking ancient Greek would give me a great leg up in my chosen profession. Um, certainly taught me a lot about language, and went off to Germany because I wanted to be in a country where there was opera, which I was besotted with, and of course, American writers are supposed to live in Europe and write. Um, no, I didn't. Singing was much later. I was there. <laughs> Singing was, was years later. Um, so I was hanging out with a lot of opera singers in Germany, working on my novel, teaching English, whatever. I went through a brief flirtation with singing after about four or five years in Germany, started studying singing, um, thinking that maybe that was a way to get opera in my life, um, and ended up um, editing an English language magazine there, um, and found myself writing about cultural topics for the Wall Street Journal and Opera News. Opera News was the first one. And at that time, I met John, who was over in Paris as the cultural correspondent for the New York Times. And um, John was incredibly helpful and incredibly inspiring. And I remember telling him at lunch one day emphatically that I was a writer about the arts, but would never be a critic, because that was a betrayal in some way. And, and John 
nodded and patted me on the head or whatever. And uh, <laughs> sometime later, I was in the offices of Opera News, and Opera News said to me, we are making you our critic for Germany and Austria. And I said to the editor of Opera News, I can't be a critic. I said, I have not got the background. I haven't got the desire. I don't have the knowledge. And Patrick Smith, the editor, said, you'll learn. And he sent me off to review the world <coughs> premiere of Karl Heinz Stockhausen's Dienstag from his <laughs> That was my first review. <laughs> and look where I am now. Um, I eventually moved back to the States, came <laughs> I eventually came back to the States and again partly through John's agency ended up as a stringer for the New York Times for seven years um, which was really my immersion in a lot of areas of classical music I hadn't had a lot of experience with since I had always been an opera person um, and now I'm at the Washington Post with my first staff job I was not sure I would ever have a job in my life I didn't think I was employable so it's never too late um, and one of the things I love about being at the Post and, and about criticism in general, which I eventually realized was not quite the evil profession I had thought it was, although many people would say that I am in fact the embodiment of that evil profession, um, is that it's a chance to spark, contribute, and amplify a conversation about the art. Um, the point of making art and receiving art is to think and to have new perceptions and new ways of thinking and a critic's role particularly in the age of the internet is to create a place of congregation where people who want to think about these things can gather um, not necessarily to agree with us or to follow us but um, because we have a shared interest we may differ strongly on our opinions about but the idea that we all think this is important is ultimately for me the the point of agreement and um, I would maintain that debate and uh, diverse opinion are the most fertile aspect of our job and that um, disagreeing with the critic is one of the best things you can do. Um, it would be terrible if we all moved in lockstep or if everybody followed what the critic said. Um, so that's my view of the role of what we do, particularly today at a time when classical music is reestablishing its identity in a changing world. Steve. First of all, Steve is not a music critic. Um, I began my career as a journalist, and um, I was the editor-in-chief of the Square Journal at New York University, and um, got my first job at United Press International writing captions. And after four years, um, I left to embark on a rather dangerous pursuit, which is freelance writer. And in 1970, my dream came true when the New York Times offered me the opportunity to write a profile of the then general manager of the New York City Opera, Julius <coughs> Rudell. Um, from there, I went on to write about George Schulte and Luciano Pavarotti and many other people. And for 10 years, I was um, a freelance feature writer for Arts and Leisure and the New York Times Magazine. And um, I was even offered a job, a permanent job, but I declined it. Um, in 1984, I had a career, complete career change, and I went into book publishing, and that's where I am today. And um, it's thrilling for me to be back with my good friends uh, over here um, and back in the classical music world because um, I still think that music has always been my prime passion. Thank you all. Um, uh, Steve, I'm sorry if I uh, uh, misidentified uh, you. Uh, I always thought of you as a writer about music, though, because I remember your early works, and I'm, I'm sorry I called you a critic. <laughs> <laughs> I only wish I was. <clears throat> um, I, um, I, I think I'm one of the only people here who actually um, really kind of thought I might be a critic from a very early age. Whenever I'd get given a recording or something like that, I would find myself, especially if it, uh, it confused me, frustrated me, anything like that, I would go um, and I'd sit down at my dad's typewriter and I'd just start writing what I thought of um, I, you know, I thought of this recording or that recording, and I even had a little, um, little magazine that I called Record Collector, a circulation of one, um, that I that I typed. Um, 
about 12. <clears throat> um, you know, I was, I, you know, it was just something I was fascinated by, and um, uh, I, I, you know, I still sometimes feel that way. If I'm absolutely confused by something, I will sit down and I'll write about it, and eventually I'll sort of teach myself what I need to know about it. Uh, I studied piano and composition, uh, played piano in a restaurant, uh, had a rock band that traveled all over eastern Connecticut for $15 a night, um, uh, each, each player. Um, and then I, I went to music school, um, and then I did two years at the Manus College of Music, and then two years at Columbia where I was studying fiction and, uh, and creative writing. Uh, and I remember I had this, this wonderful teacher who said, there's no way you can do both. You have to give up either music or writing. Um, and right after that, I started you know, selling articles, first for, I think, $15. It got a little bit better. Um, I, was, I, was, I was at the Soho News, which was an alternative paper back in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, and then that folded. Um, then I went to the Saturday Review, which was a very old and very conservative magazine, and that folded. Uh, and then I went to the New York Times, which is doing okay. Um, th thanks to John Rockwell, who brought me in as a stringer to cover everything that, um, uh, you know, the, the staff critics really didn't want to cover. And uh, one thing that was great about John was he always arranged when he was the music editor of the Times to give all of us one chance to shine every week where we got a really decent, meaty, plummy um, assignment which we, could, um, which we could really, you know, write six or seven hundred words on. Um, so I was there for a while. I, I, I moved to the Long Island newspaper Newsday, which had a New York edition at that point. And uh, talk about feeling like you'd fallen off the planet. Uh, I had been getting all these, um, all these letters from people, and my calls were always immediately returned when I was at the Times, and at Newsday, um, it didn't happen. Uh, but I was there for eight and a half years, and I learned about, you know, making my own plans for covering the, the New York area as, as a critic. And then um, I was hired by the Washington Post, where I was uh, chief music critic from 1995 till the end of 2007, with one year off uh, when I had the crazy idea that I could go run an orchestra. And I went to St. Louis with the St. Louis Symphony, and I proved an absolute disaster. And I limped back into journalism. Um, I've also done a lot of radio work. I, uh, I founded a record company at one point called Catalyst. Uh, and I've done a lot of different books, only maybe half of them about music. My latest is a collection of all the writing, or not all the writings, but all the best writings, in my opinion, of, of Virgil Thompson, which was published last month by Library of America. We've been talking a lot about Thompson and a lot about um, our, uh, you know, the, the, the critics who really impressed us when we were younger. Um, and uh, I, I know that I was fascinated by what, again, John was doing because John was somebody who wrote very, very knowingly about, uh, about classical music, and yet he also <clears throat> had a real understanding of rock and jazz and world music and a lot of other places. I'll never forget the time you quoted um, a song from Bruce Springsteen in a review of the Berlin Philharmonic. I thought that was, I thought that was pretty amazing. But um, so I, I became uh, sort of obsessed with the idea of trying somehow to bring the dynamic uh, and sort of uh, writerly qualities which I found in a lot of the rock press uh, into classical music, and that's sort of what I've tried to do in, in the years since. Um, it, it's kind of a strange time for us to have a conference on classical music and about criticism uh, because obviously it's not what it used to be. When I, when I first came to New York and was active, I think the New York Times had eight 
semi-staffers or half-retired staffers or special stringers writing about classical music of one sort or another. The Daily News had a full-time classical music critic. The New York Post had a full-time classical music critic. When I came to the Washington Post, there were two of us there. Um, you know, it's changed so much in the years since. I think there are, uh, we were talking about this this morning about whether there are 15 or maybe 20 people who manage somehow to make at least a fair middle class living um, writing <coughs> exclusively about classical music in, in, the in the United States. Increasingly, if, if somebody is going to get a job in this particular field, um, it will likely be as a culture critic, somebody who might cover the Nutcracker at Christmas or might write about certain films, uh, but it's, 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 much, um, it's, it's a much less music critic friendly environment, to put it mildly, and uh, there aren't many of us who manage to still, uh, to, you know, to, to still do it. Uh, I think about this a lot because since 2008, I've been down at the University of Southern California helping to run a, a program about arts journalism. And every now and then, someone will say, well, why are you, you know, leading these, you know, young people on um, <clears throat> with, with some kind of promise of a job at a newspaper when newspapers just continue to decline? And my attitude is that, first of all, that I'm not leading them on, that uh, I'm teaching them to think, I'm teaching them to define their aesthetics, I'm teaching them maybe to tell a story rather quickly. Um, and I've found that actually my students have gone on to do something in the, um, in, in the related to criticism, one way or the other. One student is now the film editor of the Village Voice. Um, but other students have gone on to uh, write biographies or write books about artistic subjects or in one or two cases to serve as sort of arts advocates for cities. Um, one actually does some planning to try to revitalize um, some, some cities with the arts, which of course revitalized a, a big part of New York um, back in the 70s with Soho. Um, and I find that they all take at least some of the lessons that I'm giving them and, and put them to use. They may not be critics in the old-fashioned way. They may not even really write paid criticism, but they're still taking the lessons and they're using them. Um, and uh, I, I have to think they probably went into what they did, at least in part, because of, uh, of their work. But, uh, I, I mean, here we are, and we were talking a bit earlier also about how in some ways there is a lot of writing about music now, a lot more writing than there's been in some time. Back in the day when there was something like 150 newspapers in New York City, maybe there was as much music criticism. Yeah, yeah, there were, there were like, I think, um, uh, you know, just, just a wide variety of of, of, different, uh, uh, of different papers in all languages, and there were 14 or 15 English language dailies. So, but now that we have the internet, there's at least a lot of intelligent and sometimes uh, rational comment on, <laughs> on, on various opera sites, various symphonic sites. Um, so there is a lot of writing. It's just hard to make a living out of it, and a lot of papers now hire somebody from the music department at the local university or something to do the occasional um, music critique. Um, so anyway, th that's something of a digression, but it really is uh, about what we see as the future of this business. Um, and I'm curious as to how my colleagues um, look at this, this gathering here where we're talking with um, extremely bright people, um, extremely passionate people about music, and it's a little hard to know how they're going to manage to go on and make a living at it. Anyone? Uh, Anne? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of talk about classical music's decline and journalism is declining and why are you training music critics because there won't be a job of music critic in the future. Um, and people have a lot of trouble, I think, conflating the institutions that propagate art 
and ideas with the art and ideas themselves. Um, it could be, yes, that orchestras are going to change a lot, and it certainly will be the newspapers are going to change a lot in the future. But music is going to continue. Music is going to be just fine. And communicating about music, writing and thinking about music in some form or other are going to be just fine. None of us are, have a crystal ball to look in and say what that's going to look like. But the tools are the same, and the knowledge is the same. And putting the tools in the hands of the people who are going to be influential in deciding it is one of the best things we can do with the experience we've gathered. Anyone else? We've discussed the fact that journalism is changing, criticism is changing, or at least the possibility of getting a decent income is changing. But so is music, not necessarily for the worse, but you know, musicians at conservatories here and around the country and the world are now being encouraged to become the magic word of the day, more entrepreneurial in the sense of trying to shape their own careers in different ways than just going out and being a soloist or being a member of an orchestra. You know, forming chamber groups, doing community involvement, uh, doing educational stuff online and so forth and so on. And um, these two currents sort of come together in the sense that <clears throat> teaching people how to write and think about music, even if they are not becoming professional critics, can feed into the entrepreneurial impetus that is behind a lot of what conservatives are encouraging, conservatories are encouraging young musicians to do. So uh, I think all of us here have an optimism that the musical public will, all, will persist in some form or another, and music will persist in some form or another, and the need and desire to talk amongst one's, you know, one's fellow audience members and to take inspiration or annoyance or guidance from published critics, whether the publishing is online or, on, or on, in print, will remain. What needs to be sorted out for everybody, musicians and uh, critics alike, is how they get paid for it. And one has some vague faith that business models will coalesce in a way that will allow uh, for some more regular remuneration for uh, this kind of work than is currently the case. I just I wanted to add that while the music world is certainly changing and this whole emphasis on entrepreneurship and making your own career and making, you know, making a different way to put your music across in the world, um, there are people of the, who are now coming out of the conservatories and creating these new models for making music. I think that it's, it behooves us to um, help us to, to train their contemporaries to be the critics of those new models. Um, I think it's really kind of interesting if you have you know, 25 and 30 year olds who are making the music to have the 25 and 30 year olds responding to the ways that um, these people are making music, that they're writing music and uh, putting together ensembles and, uh, and audiences and uh, trying to figure out how music goes forward rather than just have all of us um, who are, who granted have a, um, a historical perspective of how it was done you know, 40 years ago and we can look at it and say, oh, this is new, this is interesting, but um, to have the people who are actually on the ground um, experiencing it at the same time I think is really important. That the question of how are we going to make a living with this is not a new one. I was a self-employed freelance writer for 18 years before I came to the Washington Post. Was I only writing about music? No. I've written a number of travel guidebooks, I've done translations, I did TV work. You piece it together. Um, but I mean that's entrepreneurial too and it's not a new model and it's not the end of the world. I made a pretty decent living and in fact there were a couple of jobs that I turned down because I would have been making less selling my soul for a full-time job than I was making living in Europe and gallivanting all over Europe to do all these different things. Um, so uh, not having a full-time job writing about music is not this horrible gray future that we should be scared of. I once argued that um, London represented a kind of pre-internet model for the internet. Because although we mentioned this morning that Andrew Clark, who was arts editor and classical music critic of the Financial Times in London and recently retired, it was the last 
staff critic of classical music in England, I think. But British critics have traditionally done just what Anne did for 18 years. They've, and, and since they have a, a lower concern about conflicts of interest than we do in America, you know, they would run little festivals, they would uh, teach, they would do freelance writing, they'd write program notes, and they'd be critics for major newspapers. And they would piece together an income. And that is what more and more people used to the comfortable middle class life of a big salary and a pension and health benefits as we enjoy at the New York Times, or enjoyed, um, are, are getting used to now in America. But it's not, un, as you say, not unprecedented. Yeah, and I think you know, there really is no particular crisis of classical music criticism as such. There's a crisis of, of criticism in general. There's really a crisis of journalism. I mean, so many of our colleagues in neighboring fields uh, have lost their jobs. Book critics, film critics, pop critics, you, know, you name it. Uh, there's just been uh, uh, immense, uh, terrible uh, slashing of uh, these positions at newspapers and magazines. And of course, you know, uh, a considerable number of the periodicals themselves uh, have gone out of business. So I think it's, it's kind of amazing that there's still uh, uh, a few of us uh, still around uh, and uh, keeping it going. And it's a pity because you know, at the same time, I think we really have been living through uh, a golden age of classical music writing uh, all across the board, uh, uh, including the internet. I think especially in the case of, of certain blogs, uh, there's some really uh, outstanding uh, writing, uh, which has, I think, uh, led people into more uh, full-time uh, professional uh, careers. Uh, David Allen, uh, who was uh, recently hired as a uh, freelance critic for the New York Times, first drew notice for his blog and then for online writing, or think of uh, the pianist Jeremy Denk, uh, who very s uh, casually started writing a blog and, and it led to uh, articles in The New Yorker and, and The New Republic uh, and a book contract. Uh, and you know, uh, Lisa Hirsch and, and a number of other uh, excellent uh, writers are uh, internet based here in uh, San Francisco. Is Lisa here? Right, James? Um, uh, or uh, uh, Mark Berry springs to mind as a, as a truly formidable uh, thinker and, and writer on music uh, in, in London. So th there's tremendous writing out there. The question again is, you know, is anyone going to be paid for it? And, and that's the just very pragmatic economic question that we face. You know, it's interesting that we've been talking about entrepreneurship because I was just reflecting about two of the composers who have had um, certainly among the most uh, illustrious careers uh, in the last, say, 40, 45 years. Um, and both of them, and I wonder whether this has anything to do with the great popularity and fame that their music uh, eventually attain were real entrepreneurs. Um, uh, Steve Reich and Philip Glass back in the late 60s, early 70s formed their own ensembles because there was nobody else who was going to play it. They weren't writing for orchestras uh, and they wanted to actually control the means uh, by which their music got around. And Glass went so far as to actually form his own record company Chatham Square about 1971 or 1973, which was a long time before you know making your own records was an easy thing to do. And I wonder whether I mean, John, you you followed this this scene for a, for a very long time. Do you think that might have had something to do with the fact that they they did manage to disseminate their music um, so well? Well, sure, especially Phil, because I mean, in Orange, I mean, Orange Mountain Music is now his his label, and everything he does now, despite his inclusion on the non such records uh, tenth anniversary box, and he, they, there was a lot of class on that. But now it's all on Orange Mountain Music. I mean, Phil is a real entrepreneur. He's also, you know, the center of a John Zorn's another one, who is a real entrepreneur of his own career and his own music, and all these guys have numerous disciples uh, 
who, to the credit of Glass and, and Zorn, are not imitators of their master's styles, the most dramatic example being Nico Muley, who was Glass's assistant for a number of years. And his music has a vague, actually, Reichian quality to it, but uh, it's not conventionally minimalist in that way at all. Uh, so th these guys are sort of their own power centers of, of career development, and as you say, they're early examples of taking your own career in hand. But as you also mentioned, they didn't write for orchestras. More to the point, they didn't write for any known ensembles. In other words, Steve was right, it was doing uh, uh, you know, music for xylophones and for clapping and for four organs and all kinds of stuff. I don't know what five minutes means. What, what are you trying to say? Oh, just five minutes before we have to wrap it up. Sorry. Really? I, I thought I we were on until 3.50. At 3.50, it's only 2.45. Oops, I'm sorry, wrong time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. But you, you want an hour and five minutes of questions? No, sorry, I'm not going to switch. There are people who want to ask questions. Sure, sure. Okay, well, anyway, okay, well, just, well, just, just to finish this, this thing, I mean, Glass and Reich, in the late 60s and early 70s were writing music for no known ensembles. So they had to put together their own kind of ensembles, in Glass's case, you know, uh, electric keyboard, electronic keyboards and winds and a soprano soloist. I mean, it was a very eccentric assemblage of musicians. And the sound man. And the sound man, fully credited as a member, as in many rock bands. Yeah. In any case. So I'm a little confused as to what you want to do. Uh, well, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to open it up for questions. I ag actually... <laughs> yes, sir. I specifically said, in fact, that I don't think we can see the future of what it's going to look like, and that the point is to put the tools into the hands of people who can use them in ways that we can't imagine. Um, I think that's what we're here to do. I don't think we assume that anybody's going to go follow in our footsteps, because my job's not going to be there in 20 years. <laughs> no, no, I know. But, but, but. Also, program notes, self-advocacy. I mean, you know, whether or not they actually use these skills. The skills, yes, sir. Yeah. Exactly. Well, first of all, we don't know. I mean, some people, you know, as, as I was saying, and as I think some, some others would agree, we, we didn't realize that we could be music critics and we wanted to be music critics until actually we started doing it and found it was possible and one thing led to another. So perhaps the same will, will happen for someone at this institute and that would be marvelous if, you know, much to uh, uh, their own surprise, they, they find that they have a, a real knack for it. Uh, but beyond that, yes, I mean, I think we're, we're here to share uh, whatever we might have learned about the business of writing about music, speaking about music, communicating something about music, which can be applied so widely. And there's so many more avenues, uh, as we've been saying uh, now with the you know, internet, with, with social media, uh, the urge to have musicians uh, and composers uh, and administrators to speaking about what they do, explaining what they do, and, and I think, um, you know, hopefully we, we have something to impart in that area. It, it, it's true though, sir, that um, frankly, uh, the students have a better chance of becoming action stars in Hollywood, <laughs> statistically, <laughs> than, than they do of, of actually working, say, for a regular newspaper, because that really is shrinking. I, I do think that the, um, that the lessons, though, are, are, as Hemingway would have put it, movable feasts. Yes, sir, back there. I just wanted to just uh, respond to one of the students also. I don't think that 
uh, we're under false impressions about that, but it's really, there's an added benefit to this which we haven't really discussed, that a few of us are, 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 are performers, and uh, a lot of the people on this panel are people you know, whose reviews we covet, and it's really wonderful to actually get to talk to people and figure out what it is that people who are in this profession for real are going and listening for, and what they're looking for, and both for us to figure that out, but also for us to get a chance to talk to them and possibly influence what they listen for. <laughs> Over the course of He's here to pitch us. <laughs> well, we're learning from you too. So, 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 it, so it's a nice, um, you know, it's a nice confluence. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. As part of the new world in the, the blogosphere and so on, I'm concerned about uh, how editorial uh, editorship is involved, uh, evolving, because with so many bloggers who don't have editors, uh, the style of writing seems to degenerate somewhat, but people don't seem to care so much when they read. But so what's happening out there? Anybody want to uh, take that? I write online and I write for print. I defy you to tell me which is which if you're reading me online, unless you have an actual copy of the paper. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you asked that. I mean, I, I, uh, Alex, you've gone on often about how val valuable you felt editing to be. I, uh, as a general rule, resented editors. <laughs> and, and I was an editor for four years. I'm sure I was resented by the writers, although I worked very hard to do a light hand and let the writers speak with their own voice. Um, you know, editors can definitely catch you in stupid mistakes and, um, and point out stylistic infelicities. I mean, they can be good if they're cooperative and properly deferential. But, um, but on the whole, I wrote a blog for two years until I decided that it was just repeating what I did in journalism for no money. Um, and. I enjoyed having absolutely no editor. Uh, and I, when I write for Opera Magazine, they rarely edit me. I mean, I, on the whole, I don't think there's a great loss when there's no, no editors. Well, I think, I what think, about the position of editor talking also. about people like, like you? I think he's talking about those people who have verbal diarrhea and who just yammer on without any control. We're talking about training the writers. So what, how are people going to get training Get somebody, somebody to review with their own. You learn by doing, you know? I mean, and, and to do another cliche, cream rises to the top. The people who, are, who really have an aptitude for it and are really motivated to continue will learn how to improve. And the people who don't, a lot of blogs peter out too, you know, especially we're seeing that now. So editing doesn't matter, they just have to find their own. Well, it's not that editing doesn't matter. As a freelancer for all those years, I can say that I very seldom had much editing. Um, I really learned to get everything very tight putting it in because people don't always have time to spend a lot of time with you. And also at this particular era in journalism, our editors are so overextended and overstretched that they don't have time to do the kinds of editing they used to do. Everything has a much lighter hand now. Um, I see it at the Post every day, we all talk about it. Um, that's not to say, oh, let's dispense with editors, but that is to say that I think a talented writer with ambition who's serious will find ways to improve or to find the mentors and guides that they need to become better. Um, and the traditional gatekeeping system wasn't always as perfect as all that anyway, and it's, it's definitely giving way to some other model, but I don't think that's the same thing as saying, oh my goodness, it's all going to hell in a handbasket because that particular form of editing doesn't exist, in my opinion. I mean, there, there is a self-defining nature in the technology involved. I mean, with blogging, you can write forever. On the other hand, readers don't read forever. And the, the fact is, is that in print journalism, there are many studies showing that 95% of the readers will not read past the jump. In other words, if you have this much on one page and it says continued on page 16, 95% don't go to page 16. Well, the same is sort of true with blogging. I mean, if you do a short blog post and then press here to continue reading, I'm sure most people do not press here to continue reading. So therefore, if you have unedited verbal diarrhea, it doesn't do you any good. I hear you saying that it's sink or swim and uh, go out and find a mentor. 
Yeah, it always and, and was. And the cream rises to the top thing is right, too, that people will gravitate to the writers who are good and interesting. But yeah, in, in the age of print journalism, it was sink or swim and go out and find a mentor, too. Yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, we, we would all have uh, editors. Uh, you know, I, I've, I'm extraordinarily lucky at the, at the New Yorker. Yeah, good editors. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I just have to say, I, I just would be nowhere without, without the editors that, that really pushed me into this career uh, to begin with and, and cultivated me and encouraged me, corrected me, guided me, uh, told me the difference between what I thought my work was saying and what my work actually was saying, which is, which is just perhaps the most crucial aspect of the, of the process, the, the editor being your trial reader uh, and, and holding up a mirror and showing you how you really look. And it can be quite surprising, uh, the, the misunderstandings that can arise. So uh, I, I just owe everything to my, to my editors, but at the same time, I just have to look around and, and see the reality uh, that uh, Editors, really good editors, are, are few and far between. They're they're stretched thin. Uh, they're overworked. Uh, they're being cut left and right, along with the, the writers themselves. Uh, and so, many times, writers are, are left to their own devices. But I think Anne is absolutely right. Uh, if you are really ambitious, if you are really energetic, you can make your own editor. You can send your pieces in advance uh, to a, a trusted friend, colleague, particularly that, that kind of uh, friend who will not just pat you on the back and say that's wonderful, but, but to, to really uh, correct you and, and, and guide you. And, and so in that sense, I think it's, it's, it's possible uh, f for makeshift uh, editors to, to take the place of, of the sort of giants of, of the past. My newest stringer at the Washington Post um, is a young college graduate who started writing for various online sites. Um, I think he sent me a letter that I probably didn't answer, I confess. Um, he did, however, hook up with a critic in New York who eventually wrote me and said, you really should pay attention to this guy, and he's now writing for the Washington Post. Um, he's not making a hell of a lot of money doing it, and he's not doing it full time, but that is sort of a traditional avenue that is still very much open. Yes, back, back row. Yes, sir. I'm curious if there's anything special about music criticism versus film criticism, theater criticism, or opera criticism might be different from instrumental. I mean, or, or also are there trends, like you're looking for things now that you didn't necessarily think was important before. Something about the unique nature of music criticism. Well, I'd say that one thing that's different about music criticism than film criticism and books and television is that um, music has a, a particular language that not everybody speaks um, in terms of terminology. Um, everybody's seen a movie, um, everybody's watched television, and there's a common cultural reference about those um, art forms. Um, which in some ways I would say probably makes it easier uh, to write about them without uh, resorting to the kinds of language that um, your lay reader might not understand. So I think that's the main one. I mean, the obvious answer to your question is that non-vocal music is abstract in a way that these other arts are not. I mean, even abstract dance has the human body. Abstract painting maybe is the closest to, uh, you know, abstract instrumental music. Uh, well, opera, which is certainly part of music criticism, tells stories, has words, uh, has sets and costumes and acting, and so that's a little different kind of thing. But the, the, the trick with abstract instrumental music is how do you convey your opinion and evoke the, the experience in words, which are a whole different kind of medium. And uh, I mean, this is true really for any form of criticism, but it's more extreme in music. And, and the responses are, are manifold. I mean, 19th century writers like Schumann and so forth, despite their obviously solid technical backgrounds, or Berlioz wrote the most extravagant poetic fantasies about the music that they heard. Uh, there's a tendency in academic writing to be extraordinarily technical in the description of music, 
uh, a, a thing which we've been discussing just today is discouraged by newspaper editors who don't want to know what chromatic harmony, doesn't think their readers will know, and more to the point, they don't know what chromatic harmony is. But um, how you deal with the issue of technical terminology is almost secondary because even doing that is still distanced from the actual experience of perceiving, hearing, reading, if you can read a score, et cetera, music. And so um, it, it thus becomes a kind of uh, thrilling challenge if you feel, feel that way about it. I mean, to try to find some kind of verbal analog to the abstract musical experience. I actually think it's not at all the case that, that music is more difficult to write about than, than any other art form. There's this famous adage, uh, writing about music is like dancing about architecture and it's been attributed to Elvis Costello or Martin Mull or Steve Martin, various people. Whoever said it, it's rubbish. Uh, it is impossible to express any art form in words, whether it's music, uh, painting, poetry, language itself. You can, you can repeat a few lines from a Wallace Stevens poem, uh, but then when you get to the business of, of trying to express what they might mean, uh, you can very easily become lost, and, and it's, and it's a, a, an impossible task. It's, it, it, every art form has specialized language. Every art form has its particular uh, terminology, which the insiders will know and, and others will not. Uh, so I think it's this, this curious myth that, that music is, is the most inexpressible and, and in, inscrutable uh, of the arts. It's a business, uh, it's, it's an art form, uh, it, it, it is difficult to talk about, but not impossible. I one of the add, things, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I would add that one of our goals as music critics is to make those differences disappear, that you would like it to be on the same playing field as all those other arts, certainly in terms of your readership. One of the uh, lessons I give my class at USC, um, I, most, most of my students are in their mid-twenties, maybe pushing 30 in some cases. Um, and one of our assignments is I have them read some restaurant reviews from a man named Seymour Britschke who wrote in New York, you know, 30, 35, 40 years ago and published a number of volumes of, uh, of his criticism. And sometimes people look at me rather askance when I do this because here I am in Los Angeles having these people who weren't even born when these restaurants closed uh, read about these restaurants where they could never ever go in their life. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we have such a utilitarian attitude now and then about criticism. And what I try to do by making this assignment and then assigning them to write a critique about something we can never test in other words, we can't go eat the meal, hear the performance, uh, know the person, visit the countryside, something like that. Um, but what, what, when criticism really, really gets interesting, or so it seems to me, is when it really becomes an art form in itself, when you can read it uh, and just uh, admire it and see the way that it brings back a different world. The Virgil Thompson, the George Bernard Shaw, a, a lot of good critics have been able to do this. But I, th 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 this fellow's name was Seymour Britschke, and you can buy his books on Amazon, and I've got these little fanatics for St Seymour Britschke, uh, who, you know, he's been dead for, I think, about 15 years, and these, these kids will never try this food, but such is the way he brings back what you know, New York City was like in the 70s and 80s, and talking about the singles bar and about a place which charges a grand total of $50 for a meal with wine, which of course you know, is not a spectacular amount now, but in 1976 just seemed like you know, that was a third of a month's rent in some places. Uh, and, and so I'm interested when the criticism is actually that good, because for me, this is social criticism really almost on a level with Thackeray. And it's really interesting to read, even if the object which it is uh, dealing with is no longer there. I, I mean, I take Alex's point about 
the difficulty of writing about any of the arts. I mean, I mean, it's difficult to know your own spouse. Uh, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, it's a solipsistic world in which we live, and uh, and so therefore to make contact with another human being, let alone another alien art form, is difficult. I th therefore, however, think that. Um, you know, there, I'm enough of a Schopenhauerian to think that there is something about music being closer to the will than the other arts, <laughs> and um, and therefore a more mysterious process to write about. But I also take Tim's point that, I mean, it's presumptuous to say that, well, we're just creating artworks as good as um, Mozart's Jupiter Symphony, no problem. <laughs> but, um, you know, it is, when you read somebody like Shaw or Pache, Joshua Kosman, Virgil Thompson, you um, you get a you get a uh, a kind of artistic thrill from the writing that at least can quicken your appreciation of the music. Yes. same act of writing about music, but every one of these, depending on who's hiring you and what your, uh, you know, what, what the goal of the piece is, are slightly different. I mean, I think everybody here has probably written program notes and liner notes and as well as reviews, and they're all a critical act in the, that sense. I mean, uh, but, uh, I mean, staging an opera. The stage director is a critic. He is making a critical comment on the opera by choosing the approach he takes to staging the opera. Uh, a conductor is a critic in the sense that they're interpreting the music as they see it or hear it. Um, all these responses to a score are, are linked, but they're all subtly different. I think that relating to that question, Steve put me together with the pianist Leon Fleischer to write the story of his life. And I saw that as a double challenge to make a book that was going to appeal to as wide an audience as possible with this incredibly compelling human story about overcoming adversity and you know, not being able to play and finding other ways to express yourself. But it being Leon Fleischer, you also wanted as much music in it as possible. And you get the challenge in a book for a supposedly lay readership of when the musical description comes along, the action stops. You know, the narrative comes to a screeching halt while I give you a page or two about Beethoven. And um, so w we interleaved it. Um, we picked five pieces that were really important to Leon and put them between the chapters so that there could be segments that were wholly about the music. And if you were a lay person who didn't want to read them or who wanted to come back to them, you could continue with the story. And um, I guess that's an example of how writing about music can be, or how I tried to dovetail writing about music into a different kind of exercise. It wasn't supposed to be critical in the sense that I write criticism because it was supposed to be Leon's thoughts on it. Of course, expanded with my own prose to make it all cohere as a, as a piece of writing. I think it's also a question of intent. I mean, Alex recently did what was essentially a book review about Beethoven that turned into just to a magnificent essay about Beethoven. Um, and it didn't read like a book review at all. And I'm sure he, set, he didn't set out to write a, a, store, a standard ordinary book review. Yes, I have a question that'll be helpful for the uh, Ruben Fellows tonight and every night. Um, what is your process uh, during the performance when you're listening to the music? Do you, I'm sure you have different processes, but are you sitting there with the notebook just furiously scribbling notes, or do you just take in the music? What are your approaches? I, I think everybody's I think everybody's a little different about that. I've always treated criticism as as something like doing a life sketch. In other words, I am very, very active 
with, with all the, the notes I write because I'll often get the best line right there when I'm actually thinking about it. So I write a great deal. I, I remember being shocked by one of Alex's predecessors, Andrew Porter, uh, who was at the New Yorker for a very long time. And Andrew, at the end of a symphony, would take out you know, his, his notebook and write down a couple of sentences and put it away. I, I find myself doing it very actively and then scratching out things, say if I get an impression, say that the, um, that, 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 that the person is taking very fast tempos and I write that, and then I learn later that that's not particularly what the, what the artist continues to do, then I'll scratch it out. But um, I, I always find it very helpful to just keep writing and writing while also keeping a certain part of my brain open to actually uh, you know, deal with the whole experience. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I'm also a furious uh, note taker. I have my notebook. Uh, curiously, I, I often don't go back and actually look at the notes <laughs> that I take, but somehow the, the process uh, implants uh, ideas in, in my head and details that, that then come back to me when uh, I sit down to write. Uh, but I, I will sometimes go back and just uh, verify uh, certain impressions. But it's just, just this, it, it's just part of my, my uh, process of digesting the experience is to take notes uh, all the time. I also uh, bring scores with me to concerts. I don't necessarily look at them continuously. Uh, throughout the performance uh, because I don't want my reaction to be too pedantic and, and detail-oriented, so I may sort of follow the, the, the first movement of the score and then set it aside for the, the second movement, the andante or what have you, and, and to, to take a more uh, uh, reflective uh, uh, stance uh, and then return to the, the score. Um, and yes, I, I think one goes back and forth between the alert, detail-oriented, uh, uh, perhaps more judgmental kind of listening, uh, and the more casual, reflective, uh, meditative, sort of leaning back in, in your chair uh, type of listening, and, you know, as if uh, trying to inhabit the 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 form of the the music analyst on the one hand, and uh, the, the the general listener uh, on the other hand. Uh, sort of two, two uh, uh, phases of, of one's identity as a critic in, for a general interest magazine, uh, in my case. One, one practical um, thing about taking notes, which I do, um, and I take, I take lots of notes, and since I'm usually reviewing opera, I'm usually doing it in the dark, and I can't see them, yeah. and I can't see my notebook, and my handwriting is kind of illegible. And <laughs> I've been known to write over the same page <laughs> twice. Yes. Um, but actually, um, you know, as Alex was saying, the actual physical process of writing down your note, and even if it's just like one word or one little phrase, of, and particularly if you're sitting through you know, like a four hour opera, and you want to, and the, you, it enables you to remember to, you may not even remember what you thought at the time, but you go back and you look at your notes and you say, oh yeah, that was what happened then, and this thing happened next, and this is what I thought about it, and this is what mattered about it. So, um, yeah, I think note-taking is, I think note-taking is really valuable, even if you um, can't actually read them. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm with them. I mean, I must say that my handwriting, whatever your handwriting is, my handwriting is more illegible. You're, you're, you're a piker. You're, you're, you're a calligraphy student. In any event, I, so I can't read half the notes I take, but they do tend to um, trigger memory. You know, they just sink into your brain. Also, I was fortunate because in my intermittent years of study in Germany in the 60s, I would go over to East Berlin and you could buy every standard orchestral work in study scores for about 15 cents a score. And um, so I have a gazillion of those. Uh, I, I used to follow scores quite often, although following scores and taking notes is a kind of monkey, you know. But um, 
But, you know, big contemporary scores on giant format with curly Q plastic bindings that co the cost is super that annoy, annoy everybody anywhere near you. And that's very difficult to do. But, uh, but these little study scores from East Berlin are very helpful. <laughs> I, would, I used to took notes a lot when I was starting out at the Times in particular. Um, I sometimes don't take notes at all now. And one thing that I remember when I started at the Times, um, Tony Tomasini would talk to me about my reviews and he used to observe correctly that I used to get too fixated on little details and that it sounded kind of luxury. And I think part of the reason might have been referring too much to notes I had taken. And there's times, particularly in opera, I actually try not to take notes. There's almost always too much to say about an opera anyway. Um, and I don't want to get to be the person who's pointing at those little bitty moments. That said, I agree with what everybody else has said about the benefit of taking notes as well. But it was useful for me to be less hung up on it. And you and I are, are, were at the Post in the fairly uncommon situation these days of having to write reviews on deadline. Um, uh, me, me, yeah, me, meaning overnight. Uh, in other words, a concert would let out at nine o'clock and our review, uh, back when I was at the Post, I didn't have to put in all the, the fancy internet language and the other things that Anne has to do now. But uh, I would still only have maybe an hour or so to write five, six, seven hundred words. Um, and I remember when I first started at the Post because I was so nervous about whether I would um, be able to do this, which is something I hadn't done very much except really short articles for, for the New York Times way, way back in the early 80s, uh, when, in the old days when the follow-up on the news section was sort of the review dump and anything that didn't get uh, published during the week was published in the this sort of section two on Sunday. Um, but I used to uh, often, when I started at the, at the Post, I would write some sort of paragraphs that could be used under any circumstances that could be fit in somewhere about the music. You know, something I already knew about the score or, you know, if it was, if it was an opera, maybe a little bit of the, the history of the opera or, or the story of the opera. And what I found, very quickly actually, was because that was written at a different time and you didn't actually have the, um, have the, uh, uh, the experience of having just been to the concert, I had to completely rewrite all those things that I wrote in the afternoon because they didn't fit with, with what I finally ended up trying to write in the evening. So. I, I finally just edged it out and said, well, I'm just not going to prepare somehow, some way, the muse is going to come hit me and I'm going to get it done in an hour, and I always did. In the, in the, for the fellows, in those packet of clips that we have, the review I have of the first night of the premiere of Zeffirelli's Bohem 20 or 30 years ago at the Times was written within, in 45 minutes or something. As I'm sitting here listening to all of you, first of all, I'm impressed about uh, impressed with the homogeneity that I see, which probably is maybe illusory. <laughs> but I was thinking if I was to be a critic, one of the things I would always be testing myself on is how I came to develop my own taste. And my impression is that all of you pretty much have the same taste. You're kind of reacting to dissonance in a certain way. You have a certain history. I imagine if you found yourself in Germany in the mid-19th century, perhaps your writing and thinking would be different. And I was wondering if you would all comment on that, because I think I, for each of you, you have your own identity. You have who you are. And what we are, what we are getting is the fruits of that thought process but you're also all Americans. You're also the product of the 60s. You're also the yeah, some product of us were born and, and having certainly <laughs> more the product, product of the 60s. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I certainly think we'd be writing very, very differently in, in another century and another culture. Um, but but I, I, I would say I, I don't think of us 
necessarily as, as sharing all that many opinions. I mean, I know for a fact, knowing everybody on this stage fairly well, that I could get into a whale of an argument if I decided to really, really push my point against their point. I mean, we sort of agree to disagree on a lot of things. Um, and one of the things that critics don't usually talk about, at least until it's over, um, unless something really bizarre is going on that night, is what we're, we're covering. And I, I guess we've all been probably at a couple things, all of us at the same time, but not very often. I mean, there is some age differential up here, you know, from I mean, a 30-year swing at least between the youngest and the oldest of it, I being the oldest. But, um, and, you know, we're all Americans, we're all white, we're all college-educated, you know, in that sense there's a similarity. But, uh, and we all are not fustian conservatives or hardcore nothing but modernist contemporary music type people work ethics for the ear as the late McCree used to call it. but um, so there is some, yeah you're, you're right I mean if we had um, some jazz oriented but this is a classical music institute you know we could bring in rock critics and jazz critics we could bring in people who are expert in various forms of non-western music but that's not the purpose of this institute, as Steve conceived it, and as most of us have jobs that reflect that aesthetic. Um, so, I mean, I'm interested in your point, and I'm wondering if there were a way that we could dig up some critics who were of sharply different age or background, uh, that it might diversify this a bit, but it is still a common language. You know, most people who are intelligent critics are interested in what contemporary music is doing, have sort of moved with the times in terms of, uh, you know, what is popular in new music. It's no longer the 60s and 70s hardcore academic American modernism. It's moved into a different, for better and for worse, kind of eclecticism in new music. I think most of us share similar opera opinions. God knows Alex and I share a Wagner enthusiasm. Uh, but, uh, I mean, Heidi is particularly interested, as we will discover soon, in early music, early opera. And um, not that we are not interested in that, but it's an it's a, it's a area of differentiation. So, what can I say? I just want to ask uh, sort of a general question, but uh, I don't know when you read Take me there. Tell me a story. Engage me. Make me think that I'm actually right there. And it doesn't happen that often. And I, I, I urge you all to revel in the joys of reading Virgil Thompson, as I did not for the first time in many, many years, because we all got a packet we had to read. And it was so joyous, I can't tell you. And there we were in the 40s, and I was right there. Good prose. Good prose means an awful lot to me. Um, uh, I, can, I can often forgive a critic a lot of what seemed to me uh, uh, bad calls if I'm really interested in the argument. Um, and it's a writing job, as Virgil used to say. On the other hand, I get suspicious of some critics who have attracted the attention of the editors who are Philistines who hire them uh, because they're bright writers. And they get hired because they're bright, zippy writers. But, but uh, there have been a number of critics in my experience who could write very well and who had opinions which I found either wrong-headed or offensive. And sure, you can forgive a lot of sins on one review, but if you're in a town with a writer who is constantly writing brightly in ways that subvert the things that you think are important, such as the local contemporary music scene or uh, interesting alternative productions of operas or whatever this person has attitude about, um, the bright writing does not excuse that. 
I find that more more common in, in movie writing than I do uh, in uh, in classical music writing. I think there are a lot of movie critics who have kind of a very flashy, bright, interesting style um, and uh, don't really have much to say. I think what I value most is a writer who can put forward complex ideas and detailed musical perceptions uh, in a way that, that really comes alive on the page uh, in a way that someone not particularly well versed uh, in music, in, in music criticism, in music writing, uh, might find, if not perfectly comprehensible, um, appealing and involving, uh, absorbing, uh, and someone who comes to mind uh, as a model, really one of my great models when I was starting out uh, is, uh, I don't know if everyone on the panel will, will agree with me on this judgment, but uh, Richard Cheruskin, uh, a, uh, a giant uh, in the field of musicology, a uh, longtime professor at Berkeley, uh, is, is someone who is a, a truly formidable thinker, uh, vastly knowledgeable uh, about music, but who was also just a, a wonderful, uh, captivating, provocative, uh, controversial writer. Uh, he, it, it comes alive on the page. And Not since the Renaissance has anybody turned out a thing like that six-volume Oxford history of Western music. I mean, it's just astonishing. But that's an extremely difficult model to follow. <laughs> Perhaps not advisable. I just want to throw in that one thing I don't look for is somebody whose opinion mirrors my own. And there's a common um, idea about music critics at any given institution that, oh, well, they all think that way or they were told to think that way. And I think not until I was in a position of assigning other stringers to write reviews for the Washington Post, and sometimes you get a review back that you violently disagree with, that almost gives you pain to publish, but it is that does not make it okay not to publish it or to rewrite it, and it made me particularly appreciative of people who had hired me when I was writing things they may not have agreed with and let me publish them, um, so it comes around. Uh, yes, sir, and then, and, and then, so we'll have three, yeah. To respond to the question that you asked, Tim, when you were at the Washington Post, we lived in Salisbury, Maryland. Oh, gosh. The Post every day. And I remember telling a number of people what, why your music criticism just engaged me so much was because exactly what you said. When you wrote the criticism, it was like reading a short story. Thank you. It just <laughs> encompassed everything. When we lived in Boston uh, years ago, my mother got me to read the sports page of the Boston Globe, and I couldn't care less about sports. And what she taught me, and she was not particularly literate, was that in those days, the sports writers for the Boston Globe, when they reviewed, it was a review of last night's ball game, it was always a short story. It just picked me up at the beginning and set me down at the end. The other thing, the question you asked, I think is just the most critical question in the world. I remember, I, I'm a music critic, I belong to the Music Critics Association. And in uh, 2010, we went to Dallas for the world premiere of Jay Peggy's Moby Dick. And coming home the next night from concert and from work, there was a group of us in the front of the bus, all music critics, and a group of us in the back of the bus, all music critics. And those of us in the front of the bus thought that the performance with um, ben Hepner is the lead. He was having a really bad night that night. And the group in the back of the bus thought Ben Hepner just sounded like a million times. <laughs> <laughs> and it really evolved into a shouting night. <laughs> and I remember in, in 2007, I had to review the Banff String Quartet competition. And I was trying to figure out how am I going to do that. And I finally decided that for the whole week, I would analyze what are my priorities from my background, it's who I am. What do I listen for first? What are the sine qua non? I have a list here. I'm not going to read it to you. <laughs> now, the second half is what don't I hear? And I had to figure that out after I went home. What do I generally tend to miss, or what don't I prioritize? And I've always carried that list with me in my little book here <laughs> ever since as a way of forcing me to analyze uh, what was the difference between that group of us in front of us and the group of us in the back of us. Because we are all, and I'm sure some of you probably
probably have gotten into shouting matches with one another uh, over our opinions because it means so much to us. And we learn from one another if we're good. Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. Well, I'm not critic. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a great audience member. I go to a lot of concerts, as David probably knows, because he sees me do all the time. What I want from music, and I really don't like the word critic. I'd rather you use the word reviewer, or something a little less critical. <laughs> <laughs> what I really want is, is pretty simple. I want to know what happened, and did you like it? And I find that when you give me a lesson in music theory and uh, history, and you go to the sports section, <laughs> 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 I, I don't have the tolerance for that. Now the sad part is that other than opera, usually it's over. I'm not going to be able to go. But if you could say to me, this conductor was so wonderful, don't miss him or her, preferably her, uh, or this soloist is someone that you know you couldn't hear them last night, but they're going to be playing in right. Dallas or Philadelphia or whatever, and you know they go there. Something that really relates to the, the review, because most of us weren't at every concert that happened. But surely, surely you want to know what happened, whether the critic liked it, and why the critic liked and it. And why, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things we're doing with this institute, and I, I, I appreciate your comments. One of the things that, that at least I, I'm planning to do when I'm, when I'm working with, with the people who are, who are part of the institute is I'm not going to ever argue with what they found or whether they liked it or not. Or, uh, and I actually don't even care that much. This is just me talking. Uh, whether they liked it or not. I'm much, much, much more interested in the thought process behind how they came to admire it and learning a little bit like that. Um, I mean, it, it reminds me a little bit of, the, you remember those math tests we had when we were kids where, where it said, show your work? You know, so you couldn't just think of the answer in your head. You had to sort of like write it out. And I, I confess that I am at this point in, in my own game more interested in the showing of the work than I am in the two thumbs way up or, you know, two thumbs down kind of criticism which we see in so many of the movie um, reviews. Not so much in music. Heidi Chain. I wondered if, because we have such great people in front of here, have you guys could talk a little bit about um, finding your own voice in terms of your writing process? Maybe not necessarily as a music critic or just as a writer. Um, I think about the people over here who are you know, in their early 20s maybe, embarking on this journey, and I look at myself, and, and earlier you guys were talking about, um, you know, whether you can make a living or not, and this or that, and I, I wonder if this isn't an aside to my question, I wonder if it would be helpful to some of these people to see, and maybe it would just be terrifying, but to see that, like, I'm someone who, when I was your age, I had all those hopes, I was going to be a famous musician and everything, and then, you know what, after 48, it didn't work that way. But guess what? I still don't regret that I went and studied like the thing I love the most and had these years of my life. It has helped me in so many other ways. So it absolutely doesn't matter. I mean, yes, you have to make a living. You know, there's ways you can just find something you can do for a few hours so you have more time than the arts or whatever. So I wanted to, to have a chance to say that to you guys. But for you guys, I'm thinking, OK, so you know what it's like to be in this position. Um, and, and then as you, you know, got to have this career and do this, what, do you, what surprised you the most maybe in terms of finding your voice or what, what's the thing you know now for yourself personally, and they could all be different answers, that, that, that would have been really nice to know back then? Well, I was going to be a writer from the get-go. I wanted to be a writer. It was something I always did, but I was going to be a literary writer. And I was good at it, and I was praised for it, and I won a prize for it, and this, that, and the other. And then I got into journalism, and um, I had never done journalism, but I was a good writer, and I was smart. And um, when I was in Germany, I met um, the music critic at the time of Time magazine, named Michael Walsh, whose family introduced me to John and is sort of responsible for 
getting me into this whole racket. And um, I was writing um, articles for a magazine I was editing. Um, and I showed him a big feature article that I had written. And he came back to me, Michael is a plain spoken type, and he said, this writing is shit. <laughs> and nobody had ever said such a thing to me before because I was a good writer and I was, I was shocked. And I wasn't actually upset, I was kind of fascinated because especially if you've always been praised for something and you want to get better at it. Um, and he sat down with me and he spent like an hour going through to show how I could improve that piece. And that hour is the beginning of my journalism career. And that comment was the most helpful comment I ever got. I, um, in my mid-teens, got into writing what I perceived to be humorous parodies of whatever. And I remember one of the Pilgrim's Progress that I wrote, a parody. And I think I did that for about a year, and I think I did it because I was afraid of being serious. I was afraid of really engaging ideas, and so I would sort of, uh, joke around them. I've noticed humor of that ilk creeping back into my prose of late. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> but in between, I was a little more sober. But the other thing that I think and, uh, that uh, affected my writing style was all the work I did in my uh, 20s in um, radio. Because uh, sometimes I'd write out scripts and read them on the air, but mostly i just talk. <laughs> and um, and I think that a kind of conversational style in my writing, whatever serious points I was trying to make or whether I was writing a doctoral dissertation or whatever, but the conversational quality affected my, dare I use the word, voice. I think one of the most interesting things for me was that I really started out my writing career, I mean, after I was no longer going to be a surgeon, um, I started out my writing career as... I know. <laughs> yeah, anyone? Yeah, never mind. Um, I, I started out my writing career as a, um, as a feature writer. And I did interviews, you know, profiles, and I did. I, I, wrote, I would write these pieces for Symphony Magazine that required me to interview about 800 people. And, you know, was, they were about 2,000 words long, and they took me forever, and they paid me 25 cents. I mean, it was one of these kind of like, you know, ordeals of. Um, but I really, I loved feature writing and I loved reporting and I loved, um, you know, getting other people to talk, getting other people and figuring out what the right questions were to get other people to talk. And suddenly, I mean, well, or not so suddenly, I guess, I was, I was doing some of these kinds of things for the Wall Street Journal um, because Ray Sokolov, I started working for Ray Sokolov, who was the founding editor and a very eccentric and uh, sort of wonderful mind who started that page back in the mid 80s. Um, and he wanted all sorts of different voices on that page, different kinds of people writing about all kinds of uh, different kinds of things. And he sent me off, I don't even remember you know, what it was, I think, I don't even remember what the first thing was, but I had been writing features and he said, you know, go review this. And I thought, but who cares about my opinion? I mean, I, and this is, it's also sort of interesting. I mean, it's, um, that was an era, and you, you think that maybe women um, were already starting to feel like their opinions mattered um, in the mid 80s, but, um, you know, I went to Yale uh, in the, like, the fourth class of women, and uh, there was still sort of this idea that, uh, well, you know, you just didn't speak up too much. And, the idea that I could have an opinion and that I could um, publish that opinion and that somebody would find it interesting and somebody would find it valuable, um, that was actually a real revelation to me. And it really took me a while to get past the idea that I didn't have to hide behind other people and other people's words um, in print. And I still love feature writing and I still love interviewing, but I really enjoy having my own um, critical voice in print as well. Alex, did you want to address this or? Uh, yeah, well, I was trying to think about how I'd answer the, the question. Uh, I feel I, mean, I might have found my voice as a, as a writer relatively early on. Uh, you know, I go back and, and uh, I moved recently and, and, and look, found a box of papers that I'd written in college and started looking at them. and. 
they are stylishly written, and I sort of recognize certain ticks and devices, uh, which I, I still uh, use today. Uh, but the papers are, uh, at the same time, complete gibberish, um, uh, sort of full of this sort of post-structuralist kind of late 80s um, nonsense. <laughs> and, um, and I have absolutely no idea what I was trying to convey. Uh, and so, you know, as years have gone by, I've just tried to steadily reduce the amount of gibberish. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, project. I mean, I'm just, I'm terminally dissatisfied uh, with, with my work and always trying to do better. And, and I think that's sort of the, the lot of, of the writer uh, in so many ways. And uh, it's, <laughs> it's a bit sad to be sort of constantly in that, that state, but it, it does also sort of spur you uh, onward and and I think you you can always uh, improve your work and, and just delve uh, a little deeper so that's what I continue to, to try to do and, and not to let you know style uh, run away and, and, and take over the work. Alex, what do you think were the qualities that your high school teacher saw in you that made him say you're going to be a music Oh, that's a curious question. I, I don't know. I, because I, I, I'd written almost nothing about music at that stage. Maybe one or two of my, my papers that I turned in for class. I think there was one that, that went on and on about Schubert and how wonderful Schubert was. But for the most part, you know, I wasn't really writing anything about uh, music at that stage. But I think somehow my, my teacher, a wonderful man named uh, Jack McCune, uh, perceived on the one hand this, this deep passion for writing, and on the other hand, this, this fascination with music, uh, and, and he sort of saw how, how those could, could be woven together, uh, and, and so he made that prediction. But, but I, I was surprised, and I do remember feeling a bit affronted. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna, I apologize if I'm repeating for the, uh, for the, the fellows at the Institute here, but uh, the, the first and greatest commandment to me and, and how to learn to write has always been read it aloud and read it aloud seriously. Take, take whatever you've written, read it aloud and listen to yourself as so many of you are musicians and just listen to whether the prose manages to elevate itself into some kind of music itself. It won't always, but sometimes it can. And if you listen to it, you'll catch all sorts of word repetitions, you'll catch all sorts of eccentricities in the language that you don't necessarily want. Read it to other people if they'll listen to you, and, and especially if they'll be honest with you and make, make some good comments. Um, but at least read it to yourself. It will all, it, I, I mean, I, I tell my classes this, and they all think, eh, well, I can read it to myself. And they're not used to reading works aloud. But if they start reading it aloud, I can immediately tell when they're doing that because uh, the, the prose gets so much more smooth. And that, that, that's another thing. Um, if, if I were to try to think of the kind of prose that I really, really would, would like to write and occasionally can write, it's, it's prose that just, you know, it's, it's like the proverbial birthday cake and just putting the... Um, putting the knife on the top and letting it just fall through rather than anything standing in its way. And um, I, I, I wrote a, a sort of personal memoir uh, a few years ago and the, the favorite compliment I sometimes get on that is that it seems like it's absolutely spontaneous. And the sections that they think are the most spontaneous tend to be ones which were written in some cases a hundred times, again and again. Just changing a word, putting it back, you know, trying a sentence up at the top, just to get it to the point where it sounds like it's just absolutely spontaneous. Because spontaneity tends to be much more complicated uh, than, um, I mean, when you try to read it. I mean, if, if you looked at a pure transcript of what we've said today would be hard to understand because spoken language is so different. We start with ums and ahs and then change our voices around. Um, but, but if you can really get something that, that you can really live with and you know, give it the test of time like that. That, that, that was one said about Carl Ruggles. Somebody um, was listening to him write at his uh, 
home in Vermont, and he was playing the same chord over and over with no minimalist intentions, I promise you. <laughs> Just hitting it again and again and again, and somebody heard him do this for about four hours, and they asked him, they asked him, what are you doing in there? And he said, I'm giving it the test of time. <laughs> When, when uh, Nietzsche met Wagner, he stood outside uh, the house, and that was actually what Wagner was doing, he was oh, playing really? the same chord oh, over and over. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? We've got about... Over there. Oh, okay. Um, uh, more about writing, writing in general, how you use be in full-on writing mode. <laughs> you, uh, as you get more used to it, you may push it to the 20 minutes, you know, rather than starting when you have 40 minutes to go. But uh, there's nothing like a deadline to get the adrenaline flowing. What you have to be very careful of in that adrenaline rush um, is not making silly mistakes. And I was once in a position of writing the year the um, NEA did opera honors for the first time. And I discovered that I had to do it as an overnight, sort of at the last minute. And it was quite a long piece. It wasn't just a review. And um, I was writing at white heat. And Leontine Price sang. She sang the beautiful song that begins, Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. We all know that song. I know that song well. And I wrote that she sang, God bless America. <laughs> and many people said, you see, there's proof that Anne Majette was not at that concert, regardless of how lovingly described everything else was. So let that be an object warning about adrenaline. <laughs> I think adrenaline is important. <clears throat> A minor reason. In 1969, I was pretty much simultaneously offered the job of being the European history guy at Mills College and being Bernheimer's assistant at the LA Times. And I didn't think twice I went to LA, even though I liked Mills and for a variety of reasons. But one of the reasons that I, I mean, the main reason was I wanted to be a music critic. But the secondary reason was that I liked short-term deadlines. And, you know, I've always found it difficult to sit down. I mean, I've written two or three books, but to sit down and work three or four hours a day on an incremental basis writing a long book is harder for me than responding to a deadline. And, uh, you know, my opera magazine things are due once a month, and I'm always pushing it right to the end uh, of the, it's due in the mid-month, and, you know, I mean, I went to Aida and the Magic Flute in, you know, two weeks ago, but I didn't write the reviews then. When I come back to uh, New York on uh, the 14th of November, Ta-da! That will be the deadline, and I'll write the reviews. We have time for maybe one more question. Um, I, I want to ask somebody who hasn't asked anything yet. So. I'm just curious, how would you approach uh, re re writing a review of a CD as versus reviewing the concert? Would there be any difference in the soul? How would it be different? Or a can, or a DVD, like an opera. Or a DVD. I get one. I find it harder because theoretically you could learn the CD or DVD by heart and the pressure to hear it 25 times to really make sure I'm being fair I find very daunting. Uh, a DVD is easier because it's very much like sitting in the performance um, but I get very hung up on CDs and spend way too much time where I know people who you know review them regularly listen once through and then you write it. I always feel like I should listen four or five times to make sure. There is something about the concentrated, forced, focused attention of being in a concert hall or an opera house. And the performance begins here and it ends there and you're there in the dark and you damn well pay attention to it. With a CD, the phone can ring, you put it on pause, you want to go to the bathroom, whatever. It, it isn't necessarily as, as focused and sequent, you're surrounded by your familiar ambience. So in that sense, reviewing live performances is a more focused kind of experience. On the other hand, CDs, especially essay CDs, since the sampling rate on a regular CD is so crummy, we won't even talk about MP3s and iTunes and such, but um, the sound on an essay CD is, is pretty tolerable on a high-end system. 
And um, I enjoy reviewing them, but, uh, and I don't get 25 times, a lot of times to listen to them. I never, <laughs> But, um, like I say, the, the concentrated experience of being in a live performance is easier in that sense. Well, I want to thank you all for coming today. I hope you'll be with us tomorrow where we're actually going to be going over some of the pieces that we're going to read tomorrow morning. And um, it, it's just wonderful to be here, and I'm so grateful to all of our hosts, and thank you.